Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Sales Off Demystified. We're joined by Nicholas Gollock, who has over eight years' experience in sales operations at five different companies. So we have Kimberly Clark, Salesforce themselves, uh, <laughs> Tons of Tons of Reuters, <laughs> Beamery, and now just joined Judeal here in London. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so can we kick off by understanding how you first got into sales operations? Right. I think um, there wasn't a specific date that I decided to join sales operations. I just eventually was dragged into this area. Um, my first real like professional experience was in Kimberly Clark, but that was more focused on marketing operations and brand management. Um, we had Salesforce back then, but it was a different sort of application for Salesforce. It was more a sort of management of assets and management of competition between different uh, service providers. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very, that's the interesting thing about Salesforce. I think you can have um, it work in multiple different ways. Um, so the first actual contact was a bit before that, before mm -hmm. Kimberly Clark, but my actual first professional um, experience with was with that. And the marketing operations side of it was a lot more focused on um, managing the budget, making sure that we had all the uh, invoices correctly signed and paid. Um, we had to do all the focus groups with the different um, people to understand the key insights and packaging sort of, it was really, a, well, the idea of Cameron Clark is a fast moving consumer goods company. Um, and it was very focused on the actual like, people interaction of the marketing operations yeah. and brand management. So it was a, an interesting experience because we don't have lead management. We don't have case management. It was more of a, you know, very human interaction interface. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I basically moved to Salesforce, um, focusing specifically on business operations. I started as a business operations specialist, but quickly moved on to the actual sales operations side of it. And I started leading the entire sales operations team in Brazil because Salesforce back at the time was around 80 people. Eight zero back in back no 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 back in in, in Brazil, yeah. so we basically had nothing, no structure, no actual operations in the region. So I, you know, just decided to take that on. And so with that, so did no one push you into doing that? You saw that there was a need for this role, and then you went and did it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I just decided to actually focus on that. That's something that I had experience. I could actually add value, so I went down the path and started focusing on the data quality side of it, the insights, and also building the structure for reporting, which we didn't have, and reported directly to the, uh, it's not CEO, but the president of Salesforce in, in Brazil, and who later became the general manager for the entire region. Um, so we became not only Brazil, but uh, what we call LACA, which is Latin American Caribbean and basically built all the structure for the reporting. So built all the funnel conversions from start of the lead life cycle, mm -hmm. um, you know, the actual um, bringing in of the leads into the system and then converting them to qualified leads and then from qualified leads to sales to opportunities, stage one, stage twos, and then on. And then from that, the entire funnel of sales, making sure that we had all, not only the data quality side of it, but making sure that the quotes were re correct, the products were correct, and we were actually tracking that correctly. Um, it was an interesting experience because Salesforce is a um, was a small company. It felt like a startup, but it at the same time had the backing mm -hmm. of Salesforce globally. So we did have some headroom to do lots of things. Um, but that experience in Salesforce was more of a front end user. Uh, not a power user, but not as an administrator or a developer or something like that. It was more of the using the tool and, you know, deep diving into it. Uh, and then from there, went to Thomson Reuters um, and, you know, joined the sales operations part of the business, but it was focused on Salesforce to make sure that the entire sales commercial process was flowing through the system correctly, also tracking everything correctly. Mm -hmm. And we had a regional team to take care of uh, Brazil and also the entire Latin America. So it was a very similar role, but at the same time, more focused on the sales part, sales, Salesforce part. 
and then I decided to actually branch out and start helping with data insights and you know deep down mm -hmm. deep deep diving into the uh, data side of it and just decided to come to London because Brazil I, I didn't really think would be the the best place to be so I decided to come to London and I'm here today so I joined Beamery where I was also inside the go-to-market strategy take um Pretty, pretty much taking on the strategy of the company and driving the company forward through data, through mm. structuring the data, actually, because we didn't have anything at the time, and building Salesforce operations from the ground up. We had a pretty vanilla Salesforce instance. Have you always used Salesforce? Yes, I've always used Salesforce, mainly. I've used Pipedrive a few times mm. and Sugar CRM. Um, and Dy Microsoft Dynamics, I used twice just to test it out because it's interesting to see what the competition brings to the table. Uh, but mainly focused on, on Salesforce, yeah. And then just in the last month or two, you've moved to run sales operations at Judah. Yeah, Judah. exactly. So, so that brings us to today. Yeah, that brings us to today, yeah. Um, so current tech stack at Judah, are you able to share what the... Yeah, absolutely. Is? So currently we have, for the marketing engine, we have Pardot, which we're using to basically track and score all the leads. Um, and then we have Salesforce on the on the sales on the sales side. We have Financial Force for revenue recognition, and we have Exactly for compensation. We have um, we're now starting to acquire different tools like Calendly to actually integrate with the uh, lead scoring and also the lead cycle. But we also have Lean Data to do the, the routing and um, attribution. Uh, now we're in the process. I'm starting the process of evaluating a CPQ tool, which we would eventually be um, bringing in to organize the subscription management. Um, and in terms of data visualization, we have Heap, which is a tool to basically allow us to see uh, interactions with the platform from the um, user side and see track usage and also understand uh, patterns of behaviors. And we're in the process of also skewing down a few things that we don't need, but also bring to the table things that will actually add value. So, yeah, nice. Um, moving on, can we just have an, an understanding of the, the amount of sales people and the size of your team, just so I can understand the ratio? Of so currently on the sales team, we have 27 people um, split between the account managers and the front end sales team, which is a new business. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the things that I thought was very interesting about Judo is that we have a unified view of what Salesforce should be, should look like mostly many companies that I've worked for, we have different sorts of tools integrating into Salesforce and sometimes they're not native. So the integration process can be very hard, not very smooth most of the time. Mm -hmm. So they always, always had a view of if you're, if we're going to get something that integrates to Salesforce, if there isn't a native, uh, tool then we'll have to evaluate with more care. But if there is one, like Part, for example, yeah. um, we should definitely go with that, which is a much um, cleaner yeah. view of the operations and makes life, life a lot easier, in my opinion. Uh, the reason why maybe if we go with something like CPQ, we would eventually go with the native solution. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and how many people in your sales ops team? The sales ops team is two people. Yeah. Me and we have a currently a um, new marketing operations manager yeah. who's taking care of the part of side. Got it. Um, she also has um, lots of experience in terms of um, the actual scoring, um, two years of experience, and she now takes care of the uh, initial funnel yeah. side of, of, the, of the funnel. So was there no sales ops lead before you joined? Uh, there were actually, there were two. Uh, one was also head of sales operations. She was taking care of uh, pretty much the same sort of structure. Yeah. And there was one before. Um, and can we quickly shift on to data quality now? You did mention that before. Um, what are you guys currently doing at Judel to maintain good data with inside Salesforce and part of it? So we have a, an interesting way of doing that. We, Judel is a platform where we store data and we store uh, information on, on companies, on private and public companies. Uh, so we found a way to harness that information into Salesforce. So we have that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have all of your data is also in Salesforce or only for like accounts you're working on? 
customers. We have all the data there, cool. and we have a way of constantly enriching that data. Yeah. This is part of the uh, integration that we're building with the backend API, which constantly feeds that information into Salesforce and allows us to take more you know, firm decisions. Yeah. That is a big part of our data quality. Uh, that works very well. I've seen and worked with different sorts of tools in the past, like Clearbit, for example. They um, they have they're also this sort of um, you know prospecting enrichment sort of platform. Mm -hmm. um, but having something natively done in in house is is pretty amazing. Really, yeah. So that will, so I guess for you, have, do you think that makes your job harder or easier or no change having this massive amazing database sitting in your Salesforce org? Well, easier for sure. No, absolutely. I mean, the idea of having of having reliable data that we know is already checked is actually correct. Yeah, is uh, something that I've never done before because it was always around third party apps that I yeah. use, and that makes life not only easier but we can actually rely on data a lot more. And the check the checks that we have to run are not that often because the data is correct. Yeah, that's the point. So did that then give you more time to invest in other initiatives? Because you're less, you're not having to do so many data quality projects. Or yeah, there's also the second side of data quality, right? The one, the first one is the systems coming in, bringing in the information, and the other one is from the sales side. Yeah. So the data quality side is never over in sales operations, ever. So we always have to keep tracking what people are doing, how people are doing, how people are filling in the information, if they're filling in the information at all, to be honest. So yeah, the direct answer to that is no. It, it, it will always, it, always have something always to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, can we switch now to, and probably maybe not from Julia, you've only been there a couple of months, but from your eight years of experience, working with salespeople, what is like a, what is a good way to get a sales team or salesperson to come and do something new, some new process or tool um, that they might not want to do? Like, how, how do you go around getting salespeople to, to change behavior? So that, that I think from, from the three things that I think Salesforce uh, sales operations is actually based on, which is data quality, enablement, and the actual processes compose basically the three main pillars of sales ops. That is by far the hardest one because it's really hard to show the value that you're trying to add to the day-to-day -day of a sales, as a salesperson, as a sales rep. Um, there is no actual exact math or science behind that. It's basic. I try to always show value in terms of what you can actually achieve from that. So have imp implementing a new process will, for example, with validation rules, will allow you to insert data in a specific way, right? But then we can basically say, if you have a if you have a sales rep working on a specific territory or a specific industry, I usually ask them, so how would you do that if you don't have the data? How will your job be easier without good data? So my job is to make your job easier, technically. So once we get through that barrier, and I think going back to judo, because it's by far the best example, um, we have a team that actually understands that sort of concept and that the system is there to not you know hinder their, their performance is to actually make it better and make you know life a lot easier at the end of the, the end goal is pretty much that so if you don't help it it can't help you back was that understanding already there if you deal with it before you join um there's always a constant job of you know still working that through um we have a very, I think, conscious team. Yeah, they're they're very good people in terms of you know what they can actually. Um, they know what they can achieve with a system that is in good shape. But there's always a constant, constant working on you know making sure that they are always yeah. aligned with the process. Sure. Um, making salespeople more productive. What's something that you've done previously that has managed to boost? productivity of a rep? I think automation. Automation is is by far the best way to go. And I always try to look at automation as being the go-to strategy for any sort of operation and any sort of um, 
tool that we have. Mm -hmm. If it can be automated, then great. And I always try to find these these gaps in the day to day where an automation could actually help and bring in more value. And you share any an example? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, very basic. We have opportunities opportunity life cycle, right? So it starts from the first stage. Um, so instead of having to, for example, insert when you close one, when you close win an opportunity, for example, you, there are multiple things that you should do technically on the account when it becomes a customer. So you should be filling in specific fields that are related to a customer when it converts, um, changing the, the account type, for example, of a customer. Um, but you can achieve that all through workflows and process builders. So we can actually build a sequencing where when you close one the opportunity, the only thing you need to do is work the renewal because the renewal will be automatically generated. The account will be converted into a customer automatically bringing in the new fields automatically with a different record type, with a different page layout. So this, these, are, these are small things, but actually help the sales rep not have to manually input state things, also decreasing the margin of error. So you're investing up front, either with your time or the time of a developer, to reduce, like to shave off a few minutes per opportunity close for each rep, and over a year with 50 reps, that's going to save them days. Yeah, that's a general idea. I usually, um, I've never actually worked with a developer. I usually just gathered knowledge throughout different things. So when I joined Beamery, I didn't really have the developer knowledge part of it, but I managed to gather that with the Salesforce community, with reading articles and reading, you know, the actual logic. I understand coding a bit. So you're actually helps. there building all the yeah. automations. Yeah, I build the automations, I build the process builder, I build all the workflows, um, all the validation rules. So I know exactly where to check. And if something, and that I think is the art of it. If you see a user who has an error when adding a product, for example, an opportunity, and you know how it behaves and you know the back end of it, it's a lot easier to tackle the issue and solve the issue and faster because instead of having to go to a developer or anything like that, you can just do it yourself. It's super interesting because we've had people in, that I've interviewed that have come from sales and uh, I wouldn't say a technical, have been a salesperson and then work more on the sales side, but then I also have had a few people more like you who are process, analytical, technical people. It's quite interesting how there's these two different almost archetypes and both like have their strength, right? Do you have any, um, do you think that ultimately a good set of team would need both of these archetypal, uh, archetypal personalities? What do you think? Well, I, yes, I, I answering in short, yes, I think, uh, so I think so. Uh, what I, I try, I try, try to see myself not being extremely technical, even though I have lots of technical knowledge, I, have been focusing because the technical knowledge you can learn from reading and from learning coding you can actually get that easier i think but the business side of it is i think the challenging part because you need to be with people that you you know relate you can relate to and people who can actually teach you and you can actually have to experience the the business from a top-down sort of sort of way uh, it is important. I've been through that setting where I didn't need the technical side, but I needed the actual business side yeah. of it. And yeah, but definitely we need both sides. Yeah, um, ideally. Right? So you, assuming Judeal, the sales team doubles, and you then have to go and hire someone for your team, would you look for someone with sales experience? Uh, yes, I would. I would because I also have sales experience. I was also um, an account executive a while ago. So I know the pains and I know that sometimes, but being process driven and technical at the same time, I knew the value that Salesforce could bring. So I also was there inputting data at the same time because I knew the value it could bring. Um, but you know, also need to be on the front end and if you can get the back and experience also great, but we need someone who's been there and lived through the battle that is outbounding sales and yeah. inbound sales. So yeah, I would definitely look for someone with sales experience, but I would also need someone who's very focused on, on the technical side. Um, moving on to forecasting at Judel. Are you that, are you responsible for building sales forecast or do you just 
give the head of sales the tools to do that? So it's a bit of a mix. Um, currently, when, well, at least when I joined, we had a sort of understanding of the forecast. There was the, we were using the forecast categories. It was well-structured. Uh, Judel had just um, come from a sales process rebuilding. Mm -hmm. And that was, for me, I think one of the best things because they actually, uh, from for a company that size to go through a sales process building or rebuilding, depending, um, is was a new one for me. Um, but that was good because they had all the processes there. They understood at least the path that they need sh that they should follow. If there were a little branches here and there, then that's fine. That's part of it. But the forecasting was part of it. So it was a well structured. We just didn't have dashboards. We didn't have a clear view of the new process within forecasting. Um, so I built the actual roles to replicate the initiatives that Judo was trying to, to pursue and then translated that into the dashboards and gave the uh, COO uh, the visibility that he needed plus um, you know individual visibility for each person but that is all done through Salesforce interesting which some people don't yeah. some people do it via Excel sheets or yeah. anything like that but I usually tend to prefer to keep everything within Salesforce especially now that lightning have the, the capability of easily adding quotas into Salesforce before it had to be done by a data loader. Mm -hmm. And it was a mess, a mess to do. Yeah. So, okay. So, so you're saying that your sales forecast, everything comes in through Salesforce, through the data that the salespeople are giving, and then filter that through into these reports and dashboards that you can show to the CI. Yeah, exactly. So we have uh, role-based uh, forecasting. So that's all organized now, which wasn't. So now we have the rollups, and basically the directors they can see their um, subordinates right behind, right below them, um, and then the COO can see all the directors, which are the rollups of yeah. everybody. So he has a clear view of that, and we're moving to a um, concept that if it's not in Salesforce, it doesn't exist, which I think is vital to move forward. And everything is now based on the data quality. If, if, it's, if it's not there, we don't care. And it just doesn't count, which is one way of going. Did the CIO have uh, those dashboards before you joined? Um, with the new sales process, no, there were a few, a few were broken. Um, that's the thing with sales ops people, I think. We tend to, what I've seen back in the, in the past, basically, are people who want to do things their way. So I want to do this my way. I don't care about anything else. And I think, well, technically you shouldn't because it's not your way, it's the business way. And if you do things your way, if you eventually leave, the person who's picking up from you is going to have the nightmare of a job to actually figure out your logic. So if you build something towards the business logic and you understand the business, because the business is going to be there if you leave or not, then it's a lot easier. So I tend to build things that are going to last a lot longer than I do. So everything is built with that concept in mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm building th things that will last yeah. based on roles, not people, for example, yeah. because if people leave then the dashboard break, and that is a common thing that I see. Um, so even if, if and when you would leave, the process is still- the, Yeah, that's the idea. That's right. the idea. I know that I might not last my entire life at Judo, but again, the point is, we, we, we need things to be scalable mm -hmm. and to, you know, last. Yeah. That's the thing. Um, metrics, which in your eight years career, which sales related metric have given you the most insight? Well, there are multiple, I think, uh, there's the back end side of, of the KPIs and metrics, which we, which I use to score data quality, which is what I call clean your room, which basically allows me to have a view of all owned accounts and opportunities that are either stalled with age that haven't moved through, through the pipeline in X amount of time, um, no activities since X amount of time. So you can basically build correlations between ages, ages and activities. Um, that is one that's very, very handy. Um, the breakdown of the entire business in terms of 
not only closed one, but what we are actually expanding on. So we have won the business, great, but then we still have customers. So how do we actually track that? How do we track the expansion? Uh, how do we track contraption? How do we track, track churn, gross churn, et cetera, and win ratios? But then what is a win ratio? Depends on the company. And how do you categorize win ratios? So these are very high level things that I think are very interesting. And then if we can drill down that down by industry, depending on the business, they have verticals. So yeah, then if you can drill down that into these specific verticals, then that would be very helpful. But if you, if you have to choose one, Huh, that is one or a combination of two, maybe. Okay, we can do it. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take two. Transactions and win ratios, I think. Okay, so number of total. Yeah. Yeah. And then the percentage. So the, the, forget, forgive me, I'm like not that experienced here, but win ratio is you take the total amount of opportunities yeah. and then one. One over like, close. Yeah, okay, one over total close. Nice. Yeah. We don't consider open pipeline for that at all. Got it. There are multiple things that we can look at. Uh, for forecasting, there are a few, uh, but then if you're looking at the business, then yeah, there are, there are multiple that you can actually look at. Uh, so number of activities, that tracks for performance for individual people. Um, stall pipeline, so you can know exactly what is sitting where for how long. Um, but I think if you can track the number of transactions versus the number of win one opportunities, or loss, right? And the reason that you're losing them, I think that that is that is really key mm. to understand why you're losing and why you're winning as well. Um, and a final question is on who in the world of sales ops would you really like to take for lunch? Ah, uh, wow. I think um, there is two sides to that question. One is a person I've never met, and the other one is a person who actually helped build the foundation of my of my knowledge. Mm. Um, I would definitely like to, you know, see how he's doing. And um, we haven't spoken in a while, but most of the things that helped me get into this area and actually opened my eyes and my, you know, my perception about sales operations uh, came from a person who's still back and working in Salesforce. Um, but if I could, I would definitely like to take out, I think Keith, Keith Block. He's the, well, former COO, current co-CEO of Salesforce. Um, he has an interesting story. He's been in like, Oracle for ever and then joined Salesforce back in 2015 or even more than that uh, and joined as COO and then one of the started this model of becoming co-CEO with, with, with Mark Benioff and for you to reach that sort of level, mm. you must be really good at what you do. <laughs> yeah, he must be pretty impressive. So he, he was... He went straight in as the uh, sales force. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, do you know what his role was at Oracle? Um, he was VP of operations. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, all of operations in general. Nice. Yeah. That was a good move. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. So here are the things I liked. I hadn't heard the three ways of looking at sales ops. So data quality, process, and enablement. Yeah. The other three. So that's a really interesting way of splitting down everything in sales operations. And then your point about building stuff based on business logic, not just the way you, you want to run sales ops, I think it's so, so important, right? Because like trying to well, trying to build something that's gonna outlast you, I think is very, might not actually be that great for you, but it is the best thing for the business. Yeah. And therefore actually could be a good thing for you because your boss or the business knows that you're actually building something sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so those two things. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. It was a huge pleasure to be here.